Hey everybody, uh, welcome back. So good to get to be here with you Sunday morning at Bayside of Woodland Online. And uh, oh man, it is, uh, it is fun to get to see you guys signing on and signing in. And so be sure to jump on that chat and just say hello to everybody. Uh, and again, welcome. Uh, in the midst of, of course, the crazy that continues, and I just heard that uh, it's going to get even more exciting that starting tomorrow in Woodland, uh, we're all going to be required to be wearing face masks the time we go to anywhere public, and so make sure you have your mask handy and ready. I got an email from somebody in the county just saying, hey, remember to pass it on. So, you know, they're they're looking at this one and, and working hard, so we're trying to be as cooperative as possible. Uh, on that very note of not only cooperating but contributing, uh, we want to have a time where we can really get together and do something as a church, and we want to be together and praying for our community, praying for our nation, praying for this world. And uh, so we're going to have a big prayer meeting on Thursday evening via, of course, Zoom. So we want to invite you to come be a part of that. It's going to be 6.30. And uh, if you are interested, just click on this link that you're going to see kind of on the on the window or the screen or in the chat area there. That'll get you uh, to send an email to us so we know you're interested, and then we will give you that Zoom account or that Zoom link back. It's the only way we can do it and set it up as a kind of a secure Zoom meeting. So if you are wanting to be a part of that Thursday night at 6.30, please uh, click on that link, or you can always just email us at info at baysidewoodland.com. Um, it's going to be great, but prayer, as you know, is a huge way in which we, uh, we get to go before God and as a church and as his family to come together and to seek his will and his intervention in this world. So we want to just take that seriously and, and ask you to come and be a part of that with us. Also, we are going to be starting up with the month of May, our growth track again. And we're going to be doing that, yes, via Zoom, just like everything else, but it's going to be a great time together. And our growth track is just a, a really, it's a thing for people who are either new to Bayside, you're new to following Jesus, and you want to know more about how do you take a next step. And, uh, and yeah, these times are weird, but what better time to jump into something new and awesome and be connected to part of the church uh, than right now. And so if you want to do that, again, you're going to see a link uh, that's kind of coming up on your screen, or you can always email us at info at baysidewoodland.com. Uh, but again, we have to do it through RSVP, so let us know that you want to do that. That'll be next Sunday at 11 a.m., right at the end of our service, kind of like we normally do. Uh, but it's a great way to learn more about what does that next step with Jesus look like? What is that next step about being part of this church look like. So that's going to be awesome. We're going to continue with some worship right now. And so I'm going to turn this over to Greg and let him lead us. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger? The King of the King above all kings Who shakes the whole earth With holy thunder And leaves us breathless In awe and wonder The King of glory The King above all kings This is amazing
conquered the grave Worthy is the Lamb who was slain Worthy is the King who conquered the grave Worthy is the Lamb who was slain Worthy, worthy, worthy Oh, this is amazing grace This is unfailing love Now you would take my place Now you would bear my cross Now you lay down your life Now I would be set free Oh, Jesus, I sing to all that you've done for me Father God, we just thank you for this morning. We thank you for this time that we can be together, even if it is only online and in spirit. And um, Father, we just pray that you would bless this time. We pray that you would be in it, that you would be glorified by it, um, and that you would be glorified by our worship, that it would be pleasing to you.
Hey, you guys, uh, welcome back. I hope that was uh, just a great, meaningful worship experience for you. Um, in fact, as we get into today's topic, which is uh, just a topic about called Why Worry, uh, it is just striking to me how, how part of or the purpose of worship is to draw us away from worry. It's to bring us right back into that bigness and that presence of the God that we worship. And those two things uh, are are often at odds with each other, worship and worry. In fact, as we get into what Jesus has to say about worry, which is really exciting, we're going to get to see a little bit more of that. Uh, before we go go right to Jesus, though, I want to tell you about something I was reading. I read this book recently called Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers. And um, it's got a really fun title. It turned out to be far headier than I thought it would be with that kind of a title, but it was still really fascinating. And, and in it, he, this guy, the author, tells a story about this dude named Hans Seely or something like that. We're just going to call him Hans. Um, and, um, and, and he was this researcher and kind of a, a psychology guy back in the 1930s, and he just graduated, and he was looking for something to kind of start and launch his career. He didn't know what that was going to be, but he had a buddy who was in the biochemistry field, and they had been uh, just you know learning new things about the body, and they had just started to pull this hormone out of the body, and they didn't know what exactly it did. And so he's like, hey, I can supply you with this hormone. You should take it and experiment on some stuff, like some rats, and see what kind of things happen, because I guess that's what you do in the 1930s when you have this bodily fluid and you're not sure what it does. So he thought that sounded great. So he got himself a variety of rats and he had a group of rats that he was going to inject this new hormone into. And he had this variety of rats that he was just going to give them like a saline solution injection, which means they should be healthy and fine. It's not going to do anything to them. And so he begins this process and he's, he's working by himself. Like he doesn't have any help again. He's like just barely out of school himself. And he doesn't really like rats. So he's got a little bit of a challenge when it comes to like reaching into this you know, big cage full of all these rats squirming around. He's got to pick them up. He's got to hold them still. He's got to stick this needle in them and inject them. And of course, they're squirming and moving and trying to bite them and scratch them. And more often than not, he's dropping the rats because, again, he's afraid of them a little bit. And they're running off and scurrying all around his laboratory. He is chasing these rats down. And at times, they're getting cornered. And they're turning around and they're chasing him. And he's, I mean, it's chaos in this laboratory for months as he's trying to figure out how to do this better and better. And so he keeps injecting these rats and putting them back. And finally, it's time to see what has happened or what has what this hormone has done to these rats. And so he takes these rats and he opens them up. And here, here's what he finds. He finds that they're full of uh, peptic ulcers, which just means stomach ulcers, greatly enlarged adrenal glands, and shrunken immune tissues, which just means these guys are jacked up. There is all kinds of stuff wrong, and he's kind of like, whoa, whatever this this hormone's effective, it gets clearly really bad, really negative impact upon these rats. So then he goes to his control group of rats that he's just been given the saline solution to, opens them up and looks inside, and when he, inside of them he finds the exact same thing. Peptic ulcers, enlarged adrenal glands, shrunken immune tissue, and he's stumped. He's like, uh-oh, like, that's not, that's not supposed to happen. That's not how this is supposed to work. There's really this clear distinction. And he's trying to figure out how could this be the case? Like, how can they have the same problems, the same disease, the same results? And so all he can think of is that the commonality is how he's been treating the rats, how difficult of a process has been injecting them and dropping them and chasing them and all of these things. So he's like, okay, I got to start this whole experiment over. So he gets more rats and he has one group, his control group that he sits in his laboratory and he just feeds them like the best rat food he can find and he leaves them alone and they get to play and they have a little exercise wheel and they're like the happiest rats that he can make them to be. And then another group he sticks up on the roof of their building where they're like surrounded by like predatorial birds flying around all the time and it's cold and windy and rainy and it's just a terrible environment and another group he sticks in the basement next to the furnace so it's way too hot and it's loud and it's always coming on and going off and it's noisy and he leaves them in this situation for like a couple of months brings it back opens them up and what he finds of course is the ones on the top and the ones on the bottom had all of these same issues the ulcers and the adrenal glands and the immune tissue because it was all a result of Stress. It was all a result of worry. It was all a result of their environment. It was all a result of expectation of what is going to happen to us that is happening constantly to them. You might just say this, that this, the simplest way of summing up his finding was simply this, that worry is just plain bad for you. That when you worry and you set off these stress responses in your body, it has all kinds of negative impacts. And we know all about stomach and stomach ulcers, but this guy was the first guy to, to really put this together with what exactly the physical consequences or the medical consequences of worry. But what's so fascinating to me about this is 
we've now known this kind of stuff for a long time. I mean, this is the 1930s. We know that worry is bad for us, but that doesn't make it easy necessarily to stop worrying. In fact, it makes it really interesting to me too that while we can learn all this and learn that this is one of the most common and one of the most expensive health issues of our day and our age, medically speaking, that Jesus spoke to this very issue of worry 2,000 years ago. In fact, I love this. He's, he has this question he asks. He says, who of you by worrying can add a single hour to his life? And maybe you've heard that one before. Maybe that's a new one, but it's a really great question because Jesus is just saying, like, let's just do a quick reality check about worry. Like, who of you, by, by, by using worry and making it a part of your life, have, have been able to extend your life, add any hours to your life? Another way of saying is, how many of you have, have which, I mean, life is pretty much what? Life is pretty much time, right? You run out of time, and you ultimately, you run out of life, right? Those two things kind of go together. So he's saying, how many of you have been able to extend your life in any way, shape, or form? Now, what we just learned about worry is if worry does anything to our lives, it makes it shorter, right? There's, you have less life because of worry, not more life because of worry. So why is it that we keep Worrying. What is it that makes us so fundamentally a part of us as human beings and our human nature? It's kind of the question that both Jesus and the science leaves us with. Well, this was fascinating to me. I did a little research on worry and anxiety because, you know, we live in times that are extra full of worry and stress and anxiety. And this, this reason just cracked me up. And I saw this in numbers of different places. So I think it's pretty darn true and accurate. But the number one cause of worry is this, positive beliefs about the usefulness of, of worry. I'll be honest, I didn't see that coming. I thought for sure the number one cause of worry would be like a thing. Like, you know, when I was a kid, it was nuclear war. You know, like, oh man, World War III is going to break out at any moment. Right now, it may be, we think coronavirus is the number one worry, or it's what's happening to our economy is the number one worry. But it isn't a thing. It's not an object of our worry. The number one cause of worry is actually that belief about the usefulness of worry. I think this is so interesting, and, and you have to kind of take a little pause here. You have to just kind of, kind of ask yourself a couple of questions. Like, have you ever thought of worry as being useful? Because if something is useful, then we really don't like to get rid of it, right? If it's useful, there's a purpose behind it. It's significant. It might even be powerful, right, to us personally. And so we don't give up that kind of stuff really quickly. But what are some of the ways, what are some of the arguments that we don't tell other people necessarily, but we certainly tell ourselves about how useful worry is? And I want to take a moment just to kind of walk through some of these because it was so insightful, at least it was to me. One is this, worry helps me problem solve or worry keeps me motivated. Kind of the same idea, right? This is the, the procrastinator solution of the value and the usefulness of worry, right? So if you can think back to points in your life, maybe especially when you were young, uh, where you maybe were procrastinating, like when are you going to do your homework? Well, I'm not going to do my homework Friday night. Only the weird kids do homework on Friday night, which is one of my daughters, but I'm not going to name any names. Right, but, but some people do, but you know, they're like, I don't even understand those people. Most of us wait till Sunday night or we wait till the night before the project was due, right? I mean, are we doing all night or before the big exam when you get into college, right? Why'd you wait till the last night? Because I just wasn't motivated, right? Well, this is just, it's, it's, a, it's a simple, basic concept of life that we all kind of get and know. And as long as your responsibilities are limited in a sort of a manageable way, they only come up one at a time, that procrastination method can kind of work like you can wait till the last second. But at some point in time, when, as our responsibilities tend to grow, we realize can't keep waiting to the last minute and get enough things done. If we have five things all due on the same day, you can't wait till that last night and get them all accomplished. So we begin this process of worrying earlier. We will start worrying a week out or two weeks out or a month out. And then sometimes we just find ourselves entering this stage of like, well, I'm just going to worry about it all the time. I'm going to worry about the start of the semester. I'm going to worry about it when I start the job. I'm going to worry about when we start the project, right? We're just going to have worry there so that I'm always motivated to get it done. I mean, maybe those bills, maybe that mortgage, it's always motivating me with a little bit of worry of what we're going to lose if I don't go to work. And that's what keeps me going. And so worry becomes this foundational piece of our life. Well, that's just the first one. Check out the next one. I love this. Worry is a positive personality trait. It means I am a responsible individual. Now, typically you, you believe this one if you were one of those people who were born a worrier. 
And some of you, some of you were like your parents. If you ask them, they're just like, "Oh yeah, that child worried like crazy as a child. They always had stomach issues, right? They always had side effects of that." Man, we can we just always are working again to stop worrying. Like it was, it came to you naturally. You didn't even have to learn it. You just were born ready to be a worrier. But you tend to look at that and compare that with other people, going like, "Why aren't other people worried?" And oftentimes the conclusion is worrying equals caring that those people don't seem to care about what happens to them or their life or their future or their grades, right? Or their, as you grew up, maybe your marriage or your work or your bit, I mean, and you're just not gonna care? Like it seems so irresponsible. In fact, if you are a worrier of this quality, of this line of thinking, and you ever marry or have a friend who is just one of those people who just doesn't seem to be worried about a lot of stuff, you tend to look at them as that's a very irresponsible person, and they probably drive you a little bit nuts, and you have to put up some limits on how much time you're gonna be around them because they're always setting you off. But this is the worry of, of parents, this is the worry of ownership, you know, when you when you have kids, whether you're a born warrior or not, you do start to worry because you love them so much. It seems natural to worry, but but that comes back to Jesus' point: was what is your worrying actually accomplishing? What is it actually getting done? What's it actually making happen? And that's at the foundation of worry that we're going to keep coming back to. Uh, but boy, when we have real ownership and we really do care about something, it, our worry and our care do go hand in hand. But one doesn't have to mean the other exists or doesn't. Here's my other, my, my, actually my favorite, I think. Worry can keep bad things from happening. Now, this one qualifies as like magical thinking, honestly, but it's the idea of like almost like the Murphy's Law of Worry. Like, you know, if something can go wrong, it will go wrong. Or you know, all these little extrapolations that came out of Murphy's Law, which one of my all-time favorites was, you know, if you have a piece of bread with jam on top, the odds of you dropping it and it landing jam side down is in direct proportion to the cost and value of the carpet that it's going to land on, right? So I'm like, it's always going to get worse if it's more valuable. Um, but this is that simple idea of like, you know what? As long as I worry about the worst things happening, then those things aren't gonna happen. Like it's like a good luck charm. Worry is like my superstition. Worry is just sort of like my protection from the world. I mean, it's it's right up there with, you know, astrology and my palm reading and good luck charms and my lucky rabbit's foot and all that stuff that as long as I go through this ritual or cycle and I worry about it, then you know what? It never seems to happen as long as I worried about it or it doesn't happen as bad as I thought it might happen if I'm already worried about it, or I feel a little bit more prepared for it at least, which is actually the next piece of this one as well, which is worry protects me from negative emotions, right? That there's this idea that constant worry is better than facing outright disappointment because I've already was worried things were gonna get disappointing. I was already worried that things were gonna go bad. So if I'm already worried about that, I'm never in a place where I'm like, you know, life is just great. Life is just euphoric. It is just peaceful. There's just nothing wrong. I never have to swing from, I'm having the best day to like, oh, this is really bad. Oh, I can't believe things fell apart. Oh, I'm so shocked. I'm so surprised. I'm so disappointed. I'm so hurt. I don't have to make that extreme leap of emotions that's so painful. I'm already kind of halfway there all the time so that when the bad things happen, kind of like, well, I kind of saw this coming. Now, this has the danger of becoming a self-fulfilled prophecy. I'm always expecting some bad things to come. So therefore, when they do come, I'm not surprised and I'm always looking for them. So I go to the store and there's no toilet paper. I'm like, well, I'm not surprised. Like this is bound to happen. I can't, there's no ice cream. Not surprised, bound to happen. You know, there's always something disappointing, waiting and lurking around every corner. And as long as I'm kind of worried about it and expecting it, then guess what? I'm kind of okay. (laughs) Now, some of these might hit home. Some of these might hit just near you, like the person you're sitting next to. Um... But all of us, to some degree, find ourselves in this mentality of what makes worry useful in our life. If you are a successful person in our culture, with as complicated as our culture is, more often than not, you have some serious experience with worry. And you've seen it do or accomplish some things that you look back and go like, okay, that helped me. It was, it was good to be a little worried about that. You know, prepared me for something. Like, it's really hard for us to argue and see that it didn't. And in some ways, especially if you're a task-oriented person, you can look at worry and go like, well, it helps me accomplish all kinds of stuff. If you're a people-oriented person, often you're aware that worry might help me get some tasks done, but it sure doesn't help me be a better person in the way I treat other people necessarily. There's a lot of conflict that comes from just living out a life of worry. So... 
I go through all that and say all that, not to give you one other thing to worry about, which is, oh no, I'm worrying and worrying is going to have all these negative impacts and I'm falling into this trap of worry because that just you know continues on a cycle of worry and we're not going for that. Instead, we're going to come back to what Jesus has to say, but this was so intriguing. We're going to come back to Matthew 6 where we started with that question that Jesus had, but look at where he begins this conversation on worry. In verse 24 of Matthew 6, he says this, No one can serve two masters, for either you will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Now, when he says money there, just for a little bit of clarity, he actually means all the things you can buy with money. It's actually a Greek word, mammon. It's not actually the word for money. It just means all the stuff that you can buy, that you can go get, the things that we, we want and desire and would like to have. And that can mean stuff we just like, or it can mean like the security that comes with it at times, or the belief that if I just had money, it would solve my problems. Like all that stuff is wrapped up in that word of, of mammon. But notice this, that he comes at this from a perspective of he will be devoted to one and despise the other devoted to God or devoted to the stuff and the security that comes from the stuff. But then notice this transition. The very next thing he says is, therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life. Like those are words, honestly, I can't even imagine myself ever saying to anyone. It almost sounds like dangerous advice. But I think it's so important and why I hope we can kind of take a little self-evaluation of all of our arguments why we think worry is so useful because now we have Jesus sitting here telling us, don't worry about your life. And we're either going to take him seriously and believe him or we're going to believe our own arguments for why worry is way more useful and roll our eyes at Jesus and go like, Jesus, you don't really get worry. You don't really get life. You don't really get how difficult it is. You don't really get what it, what it means. It's either going to be that or we're going to listen to Jesus. But either way, we got to come back to that word he started us with, which was devoted. And I think this is so fun. Devoted, I mean, we kind of get idea of devoted, committed, loyal. All those things kind of come with devoted. But I like to, in the Greek, there were some idioms that came up in, in the Greek language when it came to the idea of devoted. And they were this, to stick oneself to or to glue oneself to, right? Which are just great visual images, right? I mean, that's the fun thing about idioms. Like try to wrap your head around this, right? That's an idiom. You don't literally wrap your head around something. Just like you don't literally glue yourself to anything, all right? We're not being literal. But we understand the concept, like, man, I am sticking with that. I am attaching myself to that or to that person. Like, that's literally the idea of marriage, when the two become one, right? We're sticking to one another. We're forming this family. It's this idea of devotion. But I love this. Jesus is saying what you are devoted to is what you will worry about. Now, just just let that settle in your heart and your mind for a second, but... Doesn't that seem to be incredibly true? I mean, isn't that exactly what we're talking about? I mean, I don't worry about things that I'm not committed to, that I'm not devoted to, right? I mean, there's just a lot of things in this world that if I'm aware of them, I kind of go, oh yeah, that's a big deal. But if I haven't spent in time investing myself in it, I'm not that worried about it. I mean, for example, I'm very devoted to like my kids and how my children are doing in school right now, but I'm not that concerned about your children and whether or not they're passing, you know, 11th grade or their sixth grade or whatever. I mean, if you tell me and they're failing and they're having a hard time, then you're sure. That's like, oh man, I'm really sorry. That's really rough. I'll, I'll pray for you. But I'm not going to worry about it. I'm not taking it home with me to worry about it because I'm not devoted to that part of their life. And that's the way our devotion works. It's what we really care about. And there's that word again that's going to keep coming up. What we're really devoted to is what we're really going to worry about. And so you can look at your worry if you want to, to really see where is your devotion actually at. I mean, what are we worried about in this time in our lives? (laughs) And that can honestly be a rather long list. But Jesus is saying you can stick yourself to God or stick yourself to stuff. Right? That's kind of what he's setting out there with that little statement about what you can only be devoted to one. And as goes the object of your devotion, so goes you. Now, he's not saying stuff's bad again. Like God created this world and he filled it with stuff. He filled it with the things so we could make stuff. He's not saying stuff's bad. He, that's not his point at all. His point is what are you devoted to? What are you committed to? What are you really setting your life upon? 
And what happens with it is what's going to have the biggest dramatic effect upon you. And he's saying you should put that devotion on God, on your Heavenly Father, and not on the things of this world. Because the things of this world, as we know now, maybe more than ever, it's right in our face and not predictable, uncertain. Right now, right now, long-term planning is like 30 days. None of us knows what's going to happen in 30 days. How long is this going to go on? We don't know. Jesus is saying, you know what? It's not that different from the world when he was speaking. People were still worried. People still lived in uncertainty. They still had all of the crazy chaos and challenges of life that they could easily find themselves worried about. Now, what I love about this is that statement of Jesus where he says, look, because of this, I tell you, be devoted to God, but don't worry about your life. And this is what makes this so challenging, I think, for us to take Jesus seriously, to really look at and go like, okay, he means that. This isn't an idiom. This isn't an illustration. Like, this is an actual direct encouragement, command, statement of fact. Like, you should actually do this. Don't worry about your life. And it's because we really do come back to this idea that, that he's saying, don't care about your life. Because almost all of us, to some degree, believe worry equals care. Some, to a great deal, some of us even kind of casually, the things that we love and we care about the most, we're like, we worry about it. And so when he says that, what's really fascinating about Jesus is that you never, ever see Jesus kind of running around with this lackadaisical attitude of not caring. In fact, if anything, he cares tremendously, especially for people, especially for those that are hurting, for those that are in need. He goes to great lengths to show and to demonstrate care. He's insanely responsible. He's never going to advocate being irresponsible. And yet he has this incredible audacity to make that statement of don't worry about your life. So how do we do life? How do we care about life and not worry? What is our life built upon? What is it going to be stuck to that we can care about it, but at the same time, not also be worried about it? Well, Jesus puts it this way. He says, therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life. What you will eat or drink or about your body, what you will wear, is not life more important than food and the body more important than clothes. Right, so he's got a question there. We kind of take it rhetorical, you know, of like, okay, maybe he's making some good points. What, what is valuable in life? And, or what's more valuable than life? I mean, if there's, is there anything in life that's more valuable than life itself? And the answer is typically pretty easily no. That, that's not complicated. Life is its most valuable thing. These other things are elements of life. They're specifics of life. Sure, they're things that we like about life, but are they more important than being alive? No, they're not. And, and then... He asked that question, I think, to get us there, and then he makes this great statement. And it's, if you've never heard it before, this can be one that kind of leaves you going like, okay, that didn't see that coming. If you've heard it before, we tend to think like, all right, Jesus, whatever. But listen to this and, and kind of hear what he's saying. And, and imagine this, that when Jesus says this, he's not inside looking at a computer screen. He's not inside a, a well-built house. Um, he's outside on a mountain. He's outside on a hill. We've got this crowd of people around him. And I think when he says this next part, he isn't saying, imagine this. He's actually probably pointing and saying, look at this. He's saying, look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Right? So he's saying, look, look at the birds of the air. Now, one in one sense... When you're in a place where you're stressed, when you're worried, and like, frankly, right now, many of us are, that almost sounds like, okay, what is he? He's oversimplifying this. It's almost possibly a little bit insulting. Like, look at the birds there as solution to worrying. But he's, he's saying, no, really, pay attention and look for just a moment. It's almost like that stop and smell the roses. Like, slow down for a moment. Now, that's one kind of positive side effect of where we're at in life, I feel like, is that life has slowed down in kind of a healthy way. But he's saying, use that slowdown to look around for a moment and evaluate. And he says, look at these birds. Look at how they're flying. Look at how they're, they're gathering stuff for their nests. You know, look at how God has provided them with the things that they need for a life, for their home, for their food. All of these things. And his point is, these birds aren't worried about any of that, right? The zebras don't get ulcers. Neither do the birds. But their heavenly Father provides everything they need. And he's saying, you are much more valuable than they are. Underlining all of this, he's saying this. Trust in your heavenly father. Put your care in your heavenly father and understand it's because he cares for you. And sometimes, sometimes when we think about this idea of faith, of trusting God, 
that we have this idea that if I put my faith or put my trust in God, it puts me in a passive position to where I say, God's going to provide my needs. He's going to bring that job to me. He's going to make my house payment for me. He's going to take care of all of my debt or my health issues or whatever. He's just going to snap his fingers. That's how I know God's actively working in my faith. But that's not what he's doing with the birds. He's just giving the birds the things that they need. Right? He's given them the ability to go and to make a nest. He's given them the food. They get to go and they gather it. Jesus isn't advocating saying that put your faith in God and then just sit around and don't be responsible or don't do anything because he knows God gave us work. God gave us jobs. God gave us talent. God gave us time. God gave us incredible brains and minds to think and to solve problems. But he is saying that you don't have to use worry to accomplish those things Replace that worry with something else. In fact, we come back to where we started with is this question. Who of you by worrying can add a single hour to his life? How can you make more life happen by just worrying? Right? Because hours, time, it's life. That is life. How can you make more life just by worrying? Worrying doesn't accomplish anything. Sure, we might use worry to help us get motivated. That's why we tie into the usefulness. But he's saying, you know what? There's something else to tie into, and that is faith. That is putting your trust in God and how much God loves and values you. Now, that's meant to be a motivator. Faith is meant to be a motivator. Hope is meant to be a motivator because God wants to do this, because God wants to provide this, because God made me in his image and made me this way. I'm going to go do. I'm going to go work. Because I love my family and I do care about them, I'm going to go to work. I'm going to do my job. I'm going to bring home. I'm going to take care of these things, right? I'm going to be proactive because I love the life that God gave me. I'm going to achieve. I'm going to accomplish. I'm going to do my very best. I'm going to rise to the top of whatever pyramid I might be climbing, right? That is my motivation because it's who God has made me to be. And Jesus is always inviting us into this relationship of walking with God as our heavenly father trusting that he has a plan for our life, that he made us and made you on purpose, for a purpose. And leaning into that purpose isn't something you have to worry about. You don't have to worry about pleasing him because he already loves you and he's already demonstrated that love for you. He's already graciously given you this gift and this invitation that he sent his son to come down here and die on a cross for us to prove his incredible devotion to us. That we can put our faith in that. We can put our faith in that action, that, that commitment, that sacrifice, to know that this is how much God has already invested. So now to follow him, now make him the focus of your devotion. And so the question that I, that I think that I kind of get from this with Jesus is what if you replaced worry with faith in your heavenly father? I mean, this would be really saying, God, I trust you and I'm looking forward to tomorrow for what tomorrow is going to bring, how you're going to provide, how and where you're going to lead me. It may not just be me staying home or it may be me preparing, you know, getting online and learning new things or figuring out what it's going to look like as best as we can, how this recession is going to end or get resolved or what, what part I can play in this as opposed to just complaining about what other people, the government or authorities or bosses or whatever, things that we can't control but we are prone to worry about. But at the end of the day, or maybe at the foundation of that whole argument, is that statement of we have to reallocate our devotion, right? It's what we're devoted to that is going to determine whether or not this is something we should worry about or whether this is something that we should believe and we should trust God for. That he cares about us and therefore he cares about what we need. If we start there, if we reorganize if we reallocate, if we reprioritize, okay, here's our values. Okay, I care about this. Does that mean I have to worry about it? Good news is God says no, because God cares about it. He made you. He loves you. He cares about you. He knows what you need. That is what Jesus is saying. So I think for us uh, this morning, this week, in this time, in this season of anxiety and worry, that there's a simple kind of reallocation, a simple, a simple way in which we have to just begin to retrain our thinking. And I say simple, the concept is simple, but the practice is hard because we are veteran worriers. We've been worrying for a lifetime, many of us. We've learned it as a, as a survival instinct. And Jesus is saying, 
Get rid of that one. That one will actually kill you. That one will actually steal your life. It's amazing for me to think that I think Jesus is, cares more about our health and our life than oftentimes we do. And if we're willing to believe him and trust him and reallocate this devotion, we're going to discover more of that life he actually made us to have. So let's start this just with a prayer. Uh, a prayer that, that maybe sounds like this. He- Heavenly Father, today I am replacing my worry with faith in you. I, I honestly think that we have to start just by addressing and talking to God and saying, this is what you're, I hear you saying. This is what I want to do, honestly. I'd rather not be carrying around worry. I'd rather not be experiencing all this stress. I'd rather be able to walk forward in peace. I'd rather be able to walk forward into joy. I'd rather walk forward in love and in compassion than to walk forward carrying stress, carrying worry, thinking that somehow this worry is going to be powerful and useful in my life when God says, no, I can give you these other things. You can have a foundation based on faith, a foundation based on his love, a foundation then laid with you being able to build on that and to bring faith and love and joy and hope into your world and your life. Doesn't that sound way better? I think it sounds way better. Tell you what, let's, let's say this together out loud. Right, right where you're at, right in your home, your living room, in your car if you're driving, right? I don't know, wherever you're at, say this out loud. Hopefully you're not in public. You're not supposed to be, right? So out loud together, Heavenly Father, today I am replacing my worry with faith in you. Okay, one more time. Let's just say, you ready? Here we go. Heavenly Father, today I am replacing my worry with faith in you. You might want to write that down. In fact, you might even want to add a little dot, dot, dot after that worry. And you might want to fill in some blanks. You might want to even make a list. What are the worries? What are you honestly, truly, really worried about right now? Job, finances, family, health. I mean, put them all down on paper into that prayer and pray that to God and say, God, this is what I am going to replace. I'm not going to worry about all these things. I'm not going to worry about my family's health. I'm not going to worry about our financial future. I'm going to trust you with them, and I'm going to let that faith lead me to do the proactive things, the best things, to take care of the things. But I get to know my worry is not going to solve the problem. You're going to lead me. I think make that list. And I would say this, pray that prayer today. Pray it when we're done. Pray it this afternoon. Maybe pray that tomorrow morning when you're getting ready to go to work at home, and you got to figure out how to Zoom, and you got your kids all Zooming in school, and you got all this stuff to manage. And it is stressful because there's so much sometimes, and it's new. Pray that stuff before that day starts. Pray those things specifically to God. Tell him that you're going to put your faith in him and not in the power of worry to get you through it. And I have one other challenge that I I want to give you, and that is as you pray this and pray this every day, pray it along with reading Matthew 6, 19 through 34. Uh, this is the passage, and we're going to come back to it tomorrow. We're only kind of doing half of it today. We're going we're gonna to see where Jesus takes us. But if you read through this and just absorb what Jesus is saying when he says, don't worry about your life, all that he builds that on. And this is one of the most incredible blessings that is just insanely practical for our lives because we are often such champion warriors. But this is what he wants to give you and bless you with. Because it's not a command. It's not just a statement of do this. It's that invitation to trust him because he is your heavenly father, because he did make you in his image, because he did demonstrate his love for you and send his son to die on the cross to pay for all your sins. Which is an amazing thing to think that he did all of that just in one afternoon to make it possible for the sins of the world to be paid for so that we could be in this relationship with him and not have to worry. And so I would say, take these things and make them a part of your daily life this week. And, and if that's a new concept to you this morning, uh, if you have never started a relationship with God, let alone seen him as your heavenly father who loves you, who sent his son to die for you, I, I want to encourage you to take a huge, awesome step of faith towards him this morning. It's super simple. It's just, it's just like what we did. With, it's just prayer. It's just asking and confessing the truth of what we said, that you believe that Jesus did come and paid for your sins. In fact, I'm going to lead you in a quick prayer. If you want to pray that prayer, just pray this either silently in your own mind, in your own heart, or you can pray it out loud, but just pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for sending your son Jesus to die for my sin. I know that I need you as my Savior. 
I know that I've sinned. I know that I've done wrong. And I know that my life is filled with the consequence of worry and guilt and stress and regret. And right now, I want to give all of that over to you and ask for your forgiveness. And I want to live a life in relationship to you and know you and follow you. And I pray this now in the name of Jesus. Amen. If you just pray that, you just got to know that's a prayer God wants to hear. That's a prayer that God wants to answer. In fact, the moment you pray and confess that you believe in Jesus and ask for his forgiveness, it's yours. You are forgiven. It's been, it's been wiped away. And now there is a whole excited new life ahead of you, including the life where you can walk in faith and trust and not in worry. It's awesome news. If you prayed that with me this morning, please click on the link uh, that you'll see on Facebook and YouTube that just says, I prayed with Corey. It lets us know. We want to just send you just some encouragement and let you know what some awesome next steps are in your own faith as you follow him and you pursue him. Uh, we're going to transition right now, you guys, and, and Bayside, this is normally where we would take an offering. And uh, we want to invite you and encourage you to uh, make that transition to online giving. If you haven't already, uh, you can go to our website or you can download our phone app and you can go do it directly that way. Uh, but that, of course, is a huge way in which uh, all of us right now need that financial support to continue to do the ministries that we're doing. We want to thank you for the incredibly generous gifts that you've been giving. But let me pray as we continue to worship this morning. Father, we thank you. We thank you because the blessings that you give are so vast, Lord. You understand our lives so powerfully and so completely. And Lord, it's interesting how our devotion to you ties in with, with what we value in this world, with the stuff and the stuff that money can buy. And right now, we want to just give back to you a little bit of what you've given us, Lord, how we trust you with our finances. Use that to unlock the door of walking in faith and in trust and devotion to you that we can experience this incredible freedom that you want us to have. We love you. We thank you for this. And we worship you. Amen. You are here Moving in our midst I worship you I worship you You are here Working in this place, I worship you. I worship you. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here. Working in this place, I worship you. I worship you. You are waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. Touching every heart, I worship you. I worship you. You are here, healing every heart. I worship you. I worship you. You are here.
at your work and you never stop, you never stop working, you never stop, you never stop working, even when I don't see it, you're working, even when I don't feel it, you're working, you never stop, you never stop working, you never stop, you never stop working, even when I Hey guys, thanks for joining us again uh, this Sunday. I hope that you have been encouraged. Uh, I hope you've been blessed through worship and, uh, and just this incredible reminder of what God has done for us so that we don't have to live a life of worry. I want to remind you to, to join us later this week, Thursday, for that prayer time. Again, click on that link or email us at info at baysidewilland.com. As well, also a reminder, uh, next Sunday we're starting Growth Track uh, Step 1, and it's a great one to come, especially if this morning you've made some decisions and you want to grow a little closer to God. It is, it's how we take those next steps to do that. So uh, click on those links. Let us know what's happening in your lives and any ways that we can be praying for you guys. Uh, as well. Uh, as we go and remember this prayer, Heavenly Father, today I am replacing my worry with faith in you. May you have a worry-free week. Talk to you later.